All right. So welcome, everyone. Be great to see some faces on the screen as people get themselves settled and that kind of thing. Um, I'd like to start out by acknowledging traditional owners of the varied lands that everybody is meeting on today. Um, I'm personally on Ngunnawal and Yambri country. Um, I don't recognise continuous connection of the, the, the peoples have to this land and as sovereignty was never ceded. So perhaps what we, one of the things that we like to do through um, the Alive um, Centre, for which I'm co-director and lived experience lead, is ask people if they'd like to pop whose lands they're on, uh, either in their name, like I have, or um, also in the chat, just to acknowledge the various lands that we're all meeting on. Um, so I'd also like to recognise the immense value that people with experience bring to our work, um, particularly in, in suicide prevention. Um, I hope you understand from the presentations today, the voices of lived experience have the potential to transform the way we do suicide prevention and to better meet the needs of those that we support. So I was really delighted when Hayley asked me if I would uh, be the, the sort of the MC and the moderator for today's session, because what a great um, initiative to have people coming together to talk about this thing. As I mentioned, I'm um, lived experience lead for the Alive National Centre, and I also lead um, lived experience research at the ANU Centre for Mental Health Research. Um, so it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart, um, and I'm really happy to be able to introduce um, our three speakers today and then facilitate a bit of a discussion. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping ahead of our presentation. So each of our three presenters will um, present in a row and ask if you have any questions or comments that you want, just hold them over until the end when we'll have a combined Q&A session. So um, that's just um, so that we sort of keep things going. We have a really interesting and integrated discussion without kind of making the other people anxious about uh, timing and things. Uh, and the other thing I would ask in, in terms of housekeeping is, um, please, just to, to keep things a bit orderly and also to help me out because I have vision problems, please use the raise hand feature. Uh, now, if you're on a PC, um, generally in Zoom, it sits down the bottom um, under reactions for some strange reason, um, but it can vary if you're on mobile devices and you've just got to kind of try to get that toolbar to come up to find where it is. So without any further ado, I want to introduce uh, Luke Bayless, who's our first uh, presenter, who'll be talking to us about conducting research with suicide attempt survivors. Luke's a PhD candidate at the University of Southern Queensland, um, and he has fast developed a passion for listening to suicide attempt survivor stories, and he believes that lived experiences are critical for furthering knowledge about suicidal thoughts and behaviours. So Luke, over to you with your shared screen, etc., cetera, and uh, I will disappear into my corner for a while. Wonderful, thank you, Michelle. Thank you everyone for attending. I'll um, just sort out my screen sharing and we'll get started. So thank you once again. So today my presentation will explain what I research why I conduct research with individuals who have lived and living experiences of suicide. I will also talk about how I conduct my research and what that looks like in practice. Finally, I will outline what happens when a participant reports they are unable to keep themselves safe despite imminent thoughts of attempting suicide and what happens when someone reports self-harm during a study. But first, provide some context about my area of research. Contemporary suicide theories propose that suicidal thoughts on their own are mostly insufficient for an attempt to occur. Hence why there are about three to four times more people who think about suicide than those who make an attempt. The discrepancy in numbers is because an individual must overcome the inherent fear and pain involved when making an attempt to end their life. Therefore, individuals need to develop a capability for suicide to move from ideation to action. Or in other words, no capability, no attempt. Capability does not result from one thing, much like suicide does not result from one thing. Capability is multidimensional. However, knowledge about capability is lacking in lived experience, particularly with suicide attempt survivors. So you can start to see why I draw upon individuals with lived experience of suicidality. We cannot understand suicide capability 
if we generate knowledge about capability from people who evidently do not have a capability suicide. So to understand how capability develops, what comprises that, that, that capability, and whether it's fixed or it fluctuates once it's attained, my opinion is that these understandings must be generated from individuals who have lived experience of suicide. Simple as that. I do not see, do not know, I do not see how we can capture unique and rich data otherwise. And whilst I have strong opinions about suicide research today, I didn't at the start of my PhD. So I turned to the experts. And this is another reason why I was drawn to research with individuals who have lived experience. 2017 seminal report about research priorities in Australia called for future research to focus primarily on attempted suicide and that people who have lived experience warranted attention. In fact, the statement on screen, I think, is still relevant today. There is much to be learned from, from people who have survived suicide attempts. I certainly have learned a lot from individuals who lived experience and, continue, and intend to continue learning as more time goes on. So why do I conduct research with people with lived experience? It's because the experience is unique and insightful. It is a must within my area of research. And experts in the field have been advocating for such participants long before I started my PhD. How do I do it? Well, with the help of my wonderful supervisors, Professor Lamont Mills and Dr. Duplessis, we grounded my studies in the principles of trauma-informed care. At the heart of what this means for the participant is that they are empowered to make decisions about their involvement in research. For example, whether to participate or not, what they want to speak about, and even to continue participating once they start participating. What this means for me is that I provide as much transparency as possible about the research and provide a safe space based on trust and appreciation of individual experiences. My first study with lived experience participants was interviews. Actually, interviews don't sufficiently describe how I collected data. It was more of a sit and listen exercise for me whilst individuals told me their stories. The attitude I brought to this study was that I knew nothing, but to know more, I just had to keep quiet and listen. And to encourage participants to speak freely and to remind them that they are in charge of their storytelling, I made it clear that they could tell me anything they wanted to, in whatever language they wanted to, even if they thought, thought it may be offensive or because they've been told they cannot tell that part of their story previously. They could swear, they could speak about their methods, essentially just be themselves and speak to me and tell their story how they wanted to. My philosophy regarding language within a research context is that it should be raw, unconstrained, uncensored and not wrapped in cotton wool. Because language wrapped in cotton wool restricts understanding because contents of stories are hidden. As such, we do not get to the heart of the story, and that is where the rich data is stored. In fact, this philosophy extends to another study I conducted whereby I asked questions rarely asked to participants who lived experience before, let alone asked four times a day over two weeks via an app on a smartphone. I asked about fearlessness of death, perceived capability to die by suicide, and other items. This was the first time such a study had been conducted in Australia. And as you can appreciate, this study had more risk than interviews and certainly more risk than completing a one-off survey. But again, guided by the principles of trauma-informed care, I made it explicit to interested individuals that they could start the survey and withdraw, and some did. I made sure they were aware that responses were not monitored in real time and therefore no help could be provided immediately by the research team if harm was reported. And if they still wanted to participate knowing all this, more than welcome to. To provide safety as best as reasonably possible, I check responses twice a day 
<clears throat> and this was this is what I must say. Very, I'm very thankful to UniSQ's ethics committee who helped me refine the safety protocol. I had participants report they were unsafe when experiencing imminent thoughts of self-harm or intending to attempt suicide. But as you can imagine, with this type of research, this was planned for during the study. So what did I do when such reports reach me? The first thing I do is take a breath, because while these reports are unlikely during research, they are not wholly unexpected. Then I go back to my study protocol, pick up the phone and dial the number the participant provided. When they answer, I simply inform them that their responses indicate risk and I ask how they're going. Then I do what I did in the interviews. I shut up and listen. What I don't do is offer, offer, offer solutions or suggest supports. I don't do that because most participants have a history of attempting suicide and other participants have experienced or are experiencing suicidal ideation. So they are well aware of the resources available. They have the participant information sheet which has the resources available. And I don't want to patronise them by repeating what they already know. So we have a chat and most times the individuals would tell me their coping mechanisms without me asking. I also remind them they can leave the study although everyone that reported self-harm and reported being unsafe continued participating in, in the study. Some, however, do not answer the phone. And so the step I take after someone reports they are unsafe and have self-harm is to call their emergency contact. If those details are provided because those details are optional, again, reflecting the trauma-informed care approach. Or emergency contacts that I did speak to acted as a messenger between the participant and me. So that system worked well. However, there were occasions when the participant did not answer the phone, nor provide emergency contacts, and reported unsafe and self-harm. Now, this may be perceived as a little concerning for some. So when this happens, I send a text message. Some text back, all good, but some don't. For participants that cannot be contacted, contacted by a phone, or text, or emergency contact, I simply leave them alone. Because I'm certainly not going to harass them demanding they communicate. No, again, aligning with the trauma-informed trauma approach, I respect their agency and I trust their decision to continue participating in the study. I continue to monitor responses and if they report risk again, then the safety process would begin again. And I suspect individuals appreciate this because they continue to respond and completed the study. I do not have lived experience of suicide, but I do know the value of lived experience within suicide research. When conducting research with individuals who have a lived experience, I put them in charge of the data that they wish to provide, aligning with the principles of trauma-informed care. Then I just sit, Listen and learn. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Luke. That was very thought provoking. And yes, I have been noting down questions. So expect more later. And I'm sure Wonderful. plenty of others were as well. Thank you. That was really interesting. So now I want to introduce Martina McGrath who is going to talk to us about understanding disclosure of suicidality in workplaces, which, you know, Martina and I have had, had a discussion around this being another topic that's close to my heart. Um, so Martina is a PhD candidate at the Centre for Mental Health at the School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne. Um, and she also works as an independent lived experience research consultant and is currently involved in a number of research studies on topics related to suicide prevention, youth mental health and LGBTQ suicide prevention. And... Martina, you sound like me as a person who just can't resist getting involved in so many things <laughs> because there are so many things. Yeah, I think, um, thanks, Michelle. I think I, uh, Hayley and I might have had a similar conversation that I tend to say, what's happening over there? And the next thing I know, you're kind of involved because it's so yeah. interested in. So thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I will just um, do my thing and share the screen. I do have a, a couple of slides that I will bring up. So just give me a moment. 
And I'm just going to make it. Uh, can everybody see the full screen? Wonderful. All right, so thank you very much. I'm actually going to start my stopwatch because I have a, have a habit of um, perhaps going over time. So just to keep myself honest more than anything. Um, and I do want to thank Hayley for putting on these events. It's great to see, you know, these um, opportunities arising to, to come together. And um, thanks for Luke for being being the kicker offer and, and Michelle for, for being such a great moderator. As Michelle mentioned, my... Um, my project's actually on understanding disclosure of suicidality in workplaces. Uh, I'm currently part-time, so it's really kind of um, progressing as well as can be expected given, given the, the part-time status. As you can see on the, the screen, I've got three linked studies, the first of which is the systematic review. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the review um, shortly because I will focus mostly on the findings of the systematic review for the purposes of today's presentation. And then um, the second study is the what I call the, the more exciting bit where I get to do some empirical data collection stuff where I'll get to um, talk to people working in the health sector and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then the third and final study is, is actually the Delphi study where we bring together the, the findings from both the systematic literature review and obviously the empirical data collection study to then inform a set of best practice guidelines for how health sector workplaces can better respond to and provide appropriate supports for people who um, experience the suicidality. All right. So here's on my screen. These are these are just my research questions, just so you can get a bit of, I guess, a helicopter view of how I came to the topic. Um, and I guess as, just as a background to the topic, the topic was actually born out of working in in lived experience roles in a variety of ways for the last eight years, actually. And it was just one of those conversations that every room I seemed to be in, it was a quiet conversation that people would have. And, and by people I'm referring, not only to people who are in designated lived experience roles, but all kinds of workers that I was connecting with in various spaces who would perhaps quietly say, I do have a lived experience, but it, it just isn't okay for me to kind of talk about that. Or there's some, some risks potentially associated with, um, sorry, with, with disclosing. And so I became increasingly more fascinated by understanding what is it about disclosure and, and particularly of lived experience of suicide and, and, and understanding then what, what role does, does stigma and discrimination play in affecting disclosure decisions? And then also, okay, so if we know all of that, what are the appropriate responses that are, that are needed in, in workplaces to actually respond to um, people experiencing suicidality. So diving into study one, which is actually the systematic review, I'm pleased to say um, the first draft is done and I'm hoping to submit the manuscript um, next month, sometime next month. So out of the systematic review, um, 26 studies were finally included in the literature review. And I will just say that the, the focus of the systematic review was on disclosure of mental health and suicidality in workplaces. And the reason for that is because, as expected, there might not be much around disclosure of suicidality in workplaces. So really wanted to look at what was, what was the current evidence that exists around mental health and disclosure in workplaces and the interplay of um, st uh, stigma and discrimination. So it had that double focus. So as I said, uh, 26 uh, studies were ultimately included and you can see on the screen there, the date range range from, from 2009, uh, but increasingly more studies more recently, in particular five studies published um, in, last year in 2001. And in terms of the methods, um, 16, my screen keeps jumping, sorry, I'll go back. Um, six, I must have set up some timing on here, so I do apologize. Um, 16 qualitative studies, 
seven quantitative studies and three mixed method studies have been included in the systematic review. And then on the right hand side, you can see the countries that, that those studies are from. So I'll just move on and actually go to what I think is probably, um, I guess the more, more exciting part in terms of what did the results and findings of this study. And I will just mention, I didn't include it because I was trying to limit the number of slides I had, but but I actually got quite stuck. Once I, once I had all of this data uh, in Excel, in, in various tables, I got quite lost to be honest and, and wasn't quite sure how to start making sense of what I was seeing in the data. And so I did reach out to Michelle and say, ah, how do I make sense of this? And so, Wonderfully, um, Michelle suggested that I go back to basics. And so at one point, my, my apartment was adorned with butcher's paper and sticky notes. And it actually really unlocked things for me in terms of each, each main theme had a, had a poster. Uh, and I could literally then see all of the concepts and all of the main themes that were emerging and then was able to go back to actually doing it in, in you know, electronic format. So it says something to my my nature for being a visual learner that I actually needed to do that to go back to some sort of visual representation which kind of leads me nicely to my next slide actually which is again I kind of thought okay so I just want some sort of a diagram that that explains I guess on on one slide what were the main findings from the literature review and you can see them on your screen there so uh, there was lots that's, that was um, focusing on topics related to the worker role and this concept of personal versus profession, uh, professional versus personal identity. And within that, there's a lot to unpack in terms of, um, for example, certain work groups um, felt more at risk of disclosure in terms of what were the consequences to their career. And definitely one of the findings relates to more highly skilled workers felt even more at risk to disclosure, for example, doctors and nurses and psychiatrists, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but this whole thing around worker role and then balancing professional public identity versus this personal concealable stigmatized identity was, was quite apparent throughout, throughout the research. But also what came through was was a whole bunch of um, findings relating to um, the motivational and avoidance factors for, for disclosure, and they, they varied. Um, and sometimes, as you can imagine, sometimes they kind of counteracted each other in terms of what might be a motivational factor. Could also be, depending on previous experience, a reason to actually not, not disclose again in the future. But also what's come through from the findings is um, is uh, things around work, the importance of workplace culture and design and conditions as affecting disclosure decision making. So again, in terms of how supportive was the workplaces, how skilled are uh, managers and team leaders to respond to people who disclose a mental health or a suicidality concern. Um, and that would often, often from the from the twenty six studies, would then shape whether somebody would disclose again subsequent to that first disclosure. Uh, also, I'll just quickly mention in terms of um, disclosure recipients, one of the findings from the the literature is that more often than not, um, workers would disclose to their team leaders or their managers before they would actually disclose to their colleagues and co workers. And these were issues to do with um, trust and privacy and confidentiality of how the information would be handled. Didn't always mean that the outcome was going to be a great one, but that was they were the factors that, that determined why, why workers would often disclose um, to, to their supervisors or managers before to a colleague or a coworker. Some smaller findings um, related to the timing of disclosure. Um, and then there was some, some findings, there are some findings related to, but, but not a whole bunch, to be honest, in terms of what were the benefits of having lived experience at work. 
and um, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, but for, for those of us who are on the screen, perhaps not unsurprisingly, some of those benefits were that were being an advocate, wanting to be a visible, um, uh, vis visible representation of what lived experience looks like in a workplace um, to kind of um, counteract the, neg the negative um, public narrative that's often associated with, with having lived experience of something. And I'm just going to kind of wrap it up now with, well, so that's my systematic review. Happy to take some questions on it um, uh, at the end. Um, but here's what I think I've kind of learned as we get towards the end of the, the year. I'm quite envious that Luke says he's clocking off um, for a couple of weeks as I keep peddling us to write this, get this manuscript submitted um, next month. But I think I've... Um, you know, after two years of uh, as a part-time study, I kind of figured out a, a couple of things about um, about where I sit in terms of research, and that is, we are quite different beasts in terms of how we how we how we approach um, approach research. So I'm very definitely a qualitative research researcher, and 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 that just is is evidenced by the fact that I needed to get out Butcher's paper and surround my, my apartment with all kinds of sticky notes. Um, doesn't mean we can't actually connect and speak the same language, but it is a different conversation to start with. I think the other thing I've, I've learned um, so far is that <clears throat> once you enter the maze, it's very, very hard to find your way through, to be honest, um, and it can seem like a maze, but it's also a maze that I'm super, super curious and I mean, in other words, it's once you go in, you're kind of in there and you do want to get through to the other end to, to see what you learn and what's at the, um, the other end. So that'll do for me and I'll um, stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Martina. And yes, that image is me as well. <laughs> in fact, I think I've been known to run around with pink feathers on me like that. So uh, a great, great image to to leave us thinking about the differences, I think. Um, but now it's my pleasure to introduce the fabulous Hayley Purden, um, who's gonna to talk to us about lived experience engagement in suicide prevention, another topic close to my heart. Um, so Hayley is a PhD candidate at the School of Health in the University of New England, um, and comes from a place of lived experience advocacy, works with many organisations around the sector from her lived experience perspective, and her studies are complementing this work. So I, another person who likes to create their world as a whole, Hayley. <laughs> yes, indeed. I'm definitely um, embracing more of the pink feathers <laughs> in my research approach. Um, uh, I don't have any slides today um, in my presentation. I just wanted to give you a bit of a background about the research project that I'm doing and how it fits within a broader piece of my lived experience advocacy. I'm really not a traditional academic by any means. I'm, I see myself as a person with lived experience first and I'm um, using a PhD to make change under the old adage of, well, if you can't beat them, join them kind of a thing. Um, so in 2012, I joined my first advisory as a person with lived experience. The committee promised an opportunity to use what I'd been through to make change in the way that we help prevent suicide in Australia. The committee was at Suicide Prevention Australia, which is the peak body for suicide prevention. And it was a really great learning journey in the power of lived experience to really change the way that we think of and prevent suicide. In this committee, I was with others who had really varied experiences of suicide and we shared how to talk safely about suicide, how to increase the involvement of people with lived experience. And we really set out an agenda for building a collective of people with lived experience who were trained and also prepared to use their voice in suicide prevention. Now, this early work by this committee formed the precursor to the Roses in the Ocean training that maybe some of you have done who are here today. It's training that prompts people to draw out meaning from their experience, set an advocacy message and really communicate it with effect out in public. So from here, I took on any opportunity that I could that would allow me to provide advice and influence in suicide prevention. But I started to get really frustrated with the limits to the way that people with lived experience were invited to contribute. I could see that people with lived experience could not only just advise on what was safe or 
tell the story to raise money or break down stigma, but there was rarely an opportunity to really drive that agenda or contribute on a strategic level. Um, a little story here, I was once invited to be on a lived, well, be the lived experience representative on a steering committee, which was advising a large government, large scale government um, evaluation of a suicide prevention program. And at the first meeting, we went around in a circle introducing ourselves and the other members spoke of qualifications, professional roles, how many years they'd been doing what they were doing. And when it came to me, I spoke about contributing from the perspective of lived experience being the primary qualification that I brought to the table. And this really colored the perception of my contributions for the rest of the project. Each suggestion or question that I raised, it was met with an excuse as to why the team couldn't be more inclusive, while all the other suggestions by other members, they were kind of met with a bit more consideration and led to changes in the work um, project. This was a really common experience throughout the early years of my involvement, and it led me on a journey to really prove myself and my lived experience knowledge as equal in value to those with huge list of qualifications and, and extensive professional experience. Now, it really shouldn't be that way, but if you have lived experience, I'm sure you've had similar experiences. Now, instead of allowing their perspective on the value of lived experience to, to stick, I really set myself to challenge the perspective. If you know me and who I am, you'll know that stubbornness is one of my key traits. And so I set my sights on a journey into academia and a journey to show scientifically that lived experience knowledge is really a valid form of knowledge and it should be made equal to knowledge generated from programs and research. So we've fought really hard over the last 10 years to elevate the voices of people with lived experience of suicide and we've really achieved a lot. I feel kind of now that we're at a bit of a turning point where lived experience inclusion, it's pretty common, but it's often done really haphazardly um, and with no kind of systematic way. So now that we've got the recognition needed, I think it's time to start asking the hard questions about how we can do better and the direction that we can go into the future. So some of these things include, well, what exactly makes up a lived experience? We accept people who have personal lived experience in standard definitions, but more and more we're understanding the impact of more distant suicide exposure, like in a workplace, being a witness to suicide and the lived experiences of first responders and health workers who experience suicide. Currently, we don't accept these as having lived experience of suicide. I also wondered about the types of roles that people with lived experience are engaged in. And if anyone had ever looked at the way people with lived experience are involved, we've got advisors, peer workers, researchers, and more, but what does this actually look like in practice? Are there key characteristics that run through all of these opportunities? I also started looking at what were the benefits and detriments of participating in suicide prevention as a person with lived experience, what they were. And here I found a paper by my supervisors, Sarah Wayland and Miff Maple, along with Kathy McKay, who asked people with lived experience what it was like to be involved in suicide prevention. And it was this paper that led me to seek out the supervision of Sarah and Miff. Um, as well as this paper, I found declarations that involvement was healing, provided meaning to people with lived experience, but there wasn't really much around, well, what are the conditions that these opportunities need to be positive? And lastly, I wondered what frameworks and policies were in place to really describe how participation is structured. Things like payment, terms of engagement, and even things like how much decision-making power is really afforded to people with lived experience. And the work by Michelle and I, I know Suomi and Ben Freeman on the lifespan framework for engagement of lived experience really helped me to get an idea of the levels of engagement and types of roles that might exist. But I found beyond that particular piece of work, no one had really looked at consumer engagement in a suicide prevention context more broadly. Now, it sounds like a huge PhD project, right? 
Um, well, the University of New England, they didn't think so. Um, since enrollment and confirmation of candidature, I've really narrowed down my PhD focus. I started a scoping review to do a stock take of all of the evidence that exists on the topic of lived experience participation in suicide prevention. And my early results are showing that there's a lot more publications out there by organisations and governments than there are in the scientific literature. And this has implications for not only the quality and rigour of the work, but also for the way things are done in practice. I'm also not finding, I'm also finding that not many of these resources have actually consulted with people with lived experience, which I think is a huge problem. They directly and massively impact the lives of people with lived experience, but they don't actually ask them what's appropriate. Now, I'm currently seeking ethics approval to undertake interviews with people in the sector, both with and without lived experience who are involved in the participation of people with lived experience of suicide. This study follows the methodology of descriptive phenomenology, but really that's just a fancy way of saying that I'm asking people to describe what participation by people with lived experience is really like in suicide prevention. I'm looking for the description, the hows and the whats, and trying to identify what characteristics might represent what it truly means to have a lived experience and participate in suicide prevention. I suspect that people without lived experience who facilitate the engagement of lived experience view things quite differently to those who have lived experience themselves. So I'm gonna be asking both groups about their experiences. The methods I've chosen require that I don't form any hypotheses and actually that I leave behind everything that I know in order to best capture the experience of my research participants. But as someone who's part of the group of study, it's really hard or maybe not even achievable to do this. So they call this insider research and it's another key part of my study. I'll be critically reflecting on what it's like to be a person with lived experience who undertakes research within the group. I'm hoping that my study will help people in the sector to better partner with people with lived experience. And I'm doing things a bit different in to the way that academia normally works. I've launched Critical, who are bringing you the, the presentation that we're having today in order to make the research really accessible to everyone in the sector. The end game is to publish an easy to read book that prompts people to really understand and think about what these partnerships look like and mean. So how's that for advocacy? What I was really hoping to achieve from the showcase today is to demonstrate that people with lived experience are not just storytellers and advisors. Our value is not just in making sure that your language is safe and that people feel supported. Our knowledge is equal to and comparable to knowledge from research. If, if only we reframe the way that we think about lived experience participation. If you have a lived experience here listening today, I want you to believe that it's possible for you to pursue a career in research. Sometimes it's hard. I sometimes chat with clinicians, researchers and administrators at the uni that have never had to think about lived experience involvement. But I see that there's so much potential for us to advocate from the inside. See, people only know what they know and it's time for us to rock the boat and get people thinking critically. So I think a PhD is a really good way to steer the research agenda and get publications that are relevant and applicable to lived experience. I see my PhD as steering the conversation about uh, lived experience on another level, one that has clout and that people trust and use in future evidence. For me, the PhD is just another layer of advocacy in a different domain, and I'd be really interested in chatting with anyone who's had any experience around this topic. Connecting with others has been like instrumental in my journey so far um, and it will be in the future as well. So I'll leave it there for now, but appreciate your thoughts and any questions. Thanks Hayley and remind me to connect you up with a research fellow in my team who has just finished up a study we call it understanding participation, which might be quite useful for you because it's it's actually more in the general health and mental health sectors, but it's exploring some of those, you know, what does it look like and what are we trying to do? And I noticed that you've also um, 
experienced what I refer to these days as another bloody advisory group. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> oh, yeah. And having been sat on a, uh, a panel recently for the MRFF and seeing that everybody thinks an advisory group with no explanation is a brilliant way of ticking the box on involvement, that's where I just went, oh, I'm not another bloody advisory group. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually formed an advisory group for my project and um, UNE didn't have any guidance or any structures in place to help me form that group or even pay them for their in involvement. So like there's so many advisories out there, but all, there are also places where advisories would really benefit yeah. um, and, and they're just not there. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we will move into our Q&A part now. As I said, if you've got uh, a burning question or a comment that you would like, please use the raise hand feature or um, pop it in the chat because Hayley will be helping me with uh, monitoring the chat there if anybody uh, wants that. So uh, if, if everybody is going to be shy, like people usually are about kicking these things off, I do have questions, but oh, look, we've got Sue, kick us off. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, Martina, my question's to you, and I apologise if I missed this, but your research is looking at workplaces. Um, are you looking at workplaces generally and then how health services respond when people present from a workplace, or is it suicide prevention within um, health services, whether that be a, a health practitioner or a person using the services? Which, What's the distinction? Yeah, good question. So um, it, it's actually focused on the workplace responses to disclosure. So it's not so much around um, a suicide in a workplace, for example. It's around right. how does somebody who is a worker in a workplace who has a lived experience of suicidality, how do they best support that person in their work? Um, okay. The, yeah, the systematic review I looked at, just to kind of explain, it did start, looked at all workplaces. Um, however, for the empirical study, um, I'll be looking at the health sector and in particular the mental health and suicide prevention sector, because 54% of the papers were actually from that, that those two spaces. And so that's where wow. I did the study. Excellent. Great. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Hayley, I've got a question for you. Yep. So you mentioned that, you know, we need to start asking questions. Um, and, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking, who do you want us to ask the questions of? Asking questions. Around how we improve involvement. Who, who, who are we, who are we uh, attacking? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't see it as um, an attacking at all. Like early on, um, in in my journey in particular, it seemed like there was a an us versus them kind of dynamic and lived experience versus practitioners, clinicians, researchers, and and that the lived experience kind of was threatening the power that that group had. But really, what I see is that um, there are different forms of knowledge, right? Knowledge from experience, from research and from um, practice. And all of those forms of knowledge are kind of equal. So um, I've been really deliberate in, in my study to ask people with lived experience, but also the researchers and the organizations and the policy makers, because they do have an opinion um, and they have experience engaging people with lived experience. And so, yeah, it's it's not an us versus them. I, I think that questions need to be asked of everybody and we really need to have like an open and really honest uh, chat uh, in the sector. Completely agree. Okay, so Joe's asked a question in the chat. What's your view of workplaces that rely solely, solely on EAP programs? And this, this one's for anyone. I reckon probably Martina or Luke would be a better place to answer that one. <laughs> You've been put on the spot, Luke. You haven't talked yet. <laughs> yeah. You go, Luke, and then I'll jump in too. I, it's certainly not my area of expertise. Um, but I think relying solely on any one program is not going to be the best way to do things. So that's all I've got to offer on that, sorry. I suppose building on that, Luke, um, 
like it would have been pretty traumatic for you to and stressful to to have um your participants expressing um self-harm and and um, suicidality like did you use an EAP? Like how, what were the kind of things that you put in place to maintain that wellness? No, I, I didn't. Um, look, designing the study, that's where a lot of thought, a lot of reading, a lot of um, consultation with experts in the field helped refine the safety protocol and then working with the ethics committee really just made it, clear and direct if xyz was to happen then do this so um i knew i anticipated something was going to happen i knew i had a, a solid safety protocol so i just relied on that um, and then when i did speak to the people who, who had reported harm encouragingly they appreciated checking in because checking in there was a check-in question at the start of each survey checking in multiple times a day so we we maybe you might be concerned to making that that phone call. Actually, at the end of that phone call, it was it was really encouraging to hear the positive aspects of the study, which weren't even taken into consideration through all the reading and, and consultation. So it was after the first phone call, it certainly was um, not something to be concerned about. Martina, did you have something you wanted to add there? Yeah, all I'd add from, um, it's just to echo what Luke said, and certainly from the systematic review, that's one of the one of the findings was that people want a variety of options in terms of what supports they access, whether it's peer support, whether it is formal EAPs, whether it is just that time off to actually go and um, go and chat to, you know, a friend or whatever. So it isn't just one a cookie cutter approach where that one EAP is the be all and end all. We all want a variety of different things. Mm. Okay, Rachel's put a, a question in the chat, uh, which is one that was uh, burning a hole in my thoughts as well, which, you know, Luke, you talked to us about um, working closely with ethics on, you know, particularly that ecological momentary study. Um, people are curious is how, how did you actually get through that kind of design and that kind of respectful approach? Um, in order, you know, when usually the, the approach is, you know, oh my God, if people are, are, are expressing this kind of thing, you have to call emergency services. You know, that's a great question. It was certainly um, the first hurdle, I guess, when designing the study was how to get it through ethics. And when you look at the literature, the research suggests that participating in these kinds of studies does not increase risk. So that's the first step, does not increase risk. Second, how to um, assess the risk. Well, there was a global committee of, of ethicists, ethics experts, I don't know how to say the word properly, um, researchers, solicitors, lived experience participants, who all came together and, and concluded that for the people that are expressing imminent suicidal intent and or self-harm, this is what the research is designed, these are the the, the studies that are designed to help the people at this, this you know, acute stage of suicidal risk. So if we, if we, you know, steer the study away from this group of people, well, what are we conducting the research for? And so the committee with all the experts said, we'll give them the opportunity to participate in the research. If, if they end up in hospital due to self-harm, let them decide whether they want to continue participating. So if we just aim to help the people who are at acute suicidal risk and, and let them make the decisions as opposed to the researchers and ethics committees and, and everyone but them making decisions, we're not actually conducting research that's going to help people. We're conducting research that's at the, the, the early stage or the... the the less acute risk stages. So yeah. the idea was to, to be able to conduct research to help people at that acute suicidal risk with them making the decision about participating. 
I don't know if that helps. It was a bit long-winded, but that's that's a very forward-thinking ethics committee you've got there. Ours, I think the ANU one would run screaming if they saw <laughs> your study come here. So it's it's good to hear that there is. There is some thinking, and uh, particularly around agency and around the usefulness of this type of research having to be done with the people who actually do, you know, know about these things. So thank you, Jesus. Andrea. Thanks. Um, I this is a question for you, Haley. Is that I wonder, and my, you mentioned, it and uh, Michelle, you also talked about another bloody advisory committee. I wonder if we need to move away from using the word lived experience to lived experiences. And I say that because, um, you know, when we've just got one person on an advisory committee, they come with their own experience. But they, we often, you know, I guess, and I don't, do not have lived experience of suicidality. There is, is there a perception that therefore that those with lived experience represent the whole range of experiences. Mm. So in a, I guess, a roundabout way, I wonder if, if um, to open up, we, we need to be talking about lived experiences rather than the lived experience. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And um, having a single person with lived experience on a, an advisory is um, actually quite harmful. It isolates that person. Um, the University of South Australia did a whole bunch of research into um, lived experience in leadership positions. And, and that was one of the standout points um, from, for the research from me was, uh, yeah, like by having just one voice, um, you you isolate that person and you put so much pressure on that one person to be the voice of lived experience that it's actually quite damaging. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, totally agree with your point about the, the diversity of lived experience. And I think advisors who are effective and good, um, they they only speak from that, their, their lived experience. Um, the thing the thing that's emerging in, in your point about language is that lived experience, we're now referring to living experience and, and how it evolves over time. And um, yeah, the, there is a lot, so much, so much to think about in this space. Um, I'm really hoping to tease some of that nuance out in, in the interviews next year. Yeah, I tend to be that person who if somebody presents me with something that says or says that, you know, introduces me as Michelle is giving the lived experience, I'll say there's no such thing as the lived experience. I will be bringing a lived experience to this space and it may be different to others' lived experience. And they're like, you're one of those people. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> That's why you all love me. <laughs> Paul. <clears throat> Uh, you're yeah, still on yeah. mute, Paul. Sorry. I wasn't quick enough with the finger. Um, <laughs> after, after just a couple of comments, observations, um, just on that last point. From my perspective, there's three categories. There's, there's learned, there's lived, and there's living experience. So learned is where you're not directly involved, but you've been a partner, a friend associated with someone who has gone down that path of uh, attempting to take their life or um, has ended up taking their life. There is lived where you've been through the experience yourself, but you're now coping, you've got the right support strategies in place. And there's living experience where you continue to live with it. It's semi in control, but it's generally out of control at various times. I live with all, with all three. And I think there's a real clear definition between each of those when it comes to bringing people on from those perspectives and make, making sure that you understand from which perspective they're going, going to come from. And just going back to, to Luke's um, um, words, it's about the language. It's about not being afraid to have the conversation. I think it's the assist program talks about the four questions. You know, first question one, are you feeling suicidal? Yes. Do you have a plan? Yes. Do you have the resources? Yes. Okay. At that stage, it's a, a grave concern. Are you going to act on it? No. 
Okay, so that's when you back off and that's when you've got to allow that person. I'm, I'm supported by an NDIS and I'll borrow some of their, their words. It's choice and control. It's my choice and control to, to be part of this. Yes, it's going to put me at risk, but if I'm coming in with the right reasons that I want to help, I want to make a, a difference, I want to provide different insight, then that's my choice and control. If we put too much restraint, if we put too much restrictions on what people can and can't say, then what's the point of having a conversation? It's like uh, I had a discussion some years ago with a, a large um, organisation that found my story too confronting. And I said, well, so you, 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 you want to get the real insight of what it's like to walk in those shoes, to, uh, to understand what it's like to go through those experiences, but you don't want to upset people. So if I've got a tumour, I can't talk about that. I've got to say I've, I've got a he headache. Yeah, we're kidding ourselves. Sorry, we've got to be brutal and honest with these conversations. Otherwise, don't waste my time. Don't insult me um, by pretending. So I just want to give those observations and comments from a learned, lived and living experience. Thanks, Paul. Um, well, we're just about out of time. Um, Paul, yeah, I totally agree with everything that you just said. Uh, I was so excited by Luke's research project um, and the fact that, yeah, he had approval to actually ask these questions and interview these people was just like amazing to me, which was one of the reasons why um, I wanted him to bring his research to this discussion, even as a person without lived experience. I think it's really important to know that there are people uh, out there in the research space who um, really appreciate and understand the value that lived experience can bring and are willing to have those difficult conversations. And Martina, um, thank you so much for bringing your research here too. Um, I'm finding more and more discussions that I have with people. Um, it's all about, well, when is it safe to acknowledge a lived experience and and we've got more and more clinicians and people who work in this space who say well I do have a lived experience but they've never felt safe to have those discussions so I really see that your um, research has the ability to change some of those conversations and understand why that might be difficult for some people um, and Michelle thank you so much for moderating this discussion um, been a long-term fan of your work and your, your, all the stuff that you've done uh, has really helped me to shape my perspective of the lived experience uh, engagement space. Um, just before we go, uh, a word from Critical. If you want to collaborate with Critical and me um, and get messages out there, get in touch with me. I really like having these conversations and and to start to um, you know have have the conversations that we really need to have that we haven't had a platform or an opportunity to have in this space. So uh, happy to work with everybody and thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you found it. Um, enjoyable and of value and we'll see you at another event soon hopefully thanks Hayley thanks for so much and everyone Hayley. thanks Hayley thanks everyone